Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Learn with Jason. Today on the show, we have Adam Kelly. Adam, how are you doing? I'm good, yeah. Yeah, happy to be here. Happy to have you on the show. I appreciate you taking the time. I am really excited to dig into what we're going to cover today. But before we do that, I'd love to hear a little bit about you. So for folks who aren't familiar, can you give us a bit of a background? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so my name is Adam. Um, I'm a member of the developer relations team at, at Near4j. Um, so I look mainly after the um, the advocacy, advocacy side of things um, and um, developer education, basically. Um, so I describe myself as, a, I guess, a full stack developer. Um, I've been working on the web for for about 20 years now. So since, you know, layouts were in tables and you did little like uh, GIFs with um, rounded edges to, um, to to create layouts and things like that. Um, in, in the past, I've been a, a freelance web developer for a few years um, and, and a consultant. Um, I've been at NFJ for about four years now. Um, and so for two years of that, I was a uh, professional services consultant um, and I moved over to DevRel um, coming up to two years ago now. Nice, nice. And so uh, I'm always really curious about, like whenever I hear people talk about Neo4j, I'm intrigued and also have no idea even where to start thinking about it. So if people listening are, are like me, they may have heard the name, but aren't really clear on what it is. So do you maybe want to give us the, the high level overview of, of what Neo4j is? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, so ignore the, um, the name, um, the J it originally standard for Java, but, um, yeah, it, it, okay. ignore that. Um, so high level, it's a, a graph database, uh, which is a bit of a, um, I guess, a paradigm shift for, for most people that are, um, you know, um, full stack developers or back end developers that are um, uh, used to, to storing data. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, it's um, um, when I talk about graphs, I don't talk about, you know, like chart JS or something like that. I'm talking about um, graph theory and graph structures. So basically, uh, vertices and edges, or in the FJ, we, we call them nodes and relationships. But um, basically, um, nodes to represent data and then mm -hmm. relationships to, to represent the, the connection between them. Okay. And so graph databases, I feel like uh, graph databases have been sort of conflated with GraphQL, which is a, a spec, um, but they're not the same thing, right? Yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah. So uh, GraphQL is, is a way of querying a graph structure, say. So um, I, I mean, I'm not 100% up on, on, on what GraphQL is personally, but um, from what I understand, it's a way of, uh, so I, I guess like something created by um, Facebook to, to Google their, their social graph. So if you think of a, um, the, the social graph um, structure, you've got people mm -hmm. that are connected in, in different ways. So you may be a friend, you may like a profile, um, those sort of connections. Um, and the, yeah, so GraphQL is a spec for querying um, a um, a, a graph in, in a certain format. Um, so, um, yeah, so the, the, there are two ways to, to query a, an EFJ database. So you would use uh, a language called Cypher, which is a, um, a pattern um, matching language, basically for, mm. for matching patterns in, in the graph. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it's completely separate from um, GraphQL and, and, and the GraphQL spec, really. Um, yeah, so I, I guess that... Um, yeah, um, I guess like in, in most cases you'd be, um, you know, like you use a service like Hazura or, or Fauna for um, for GraphQL. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure what they, what they use under the hood. Um, it may even be like a um, sort of some sort of wrapper or something on on top of Postgres, um, which is how NFJ started in in the first place. Quite interestingly, so it's a, a oh, NFJ wrapper on uh, on on top of uh, Postgres for sort of ten years or so. Um, but the, the the founders kind of found out that 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 didn't really scale. And it's, I guess, the problem that I've seen when I've tried to use GraphQL with other um, databases um, in, in the past is that, um, yeah, like, so so you have your, your mutations and then you, you, you go away, you'd fetch something that would come back and then you'd have, um, for like, for, for nesting, you'd have to go away and fetch other items from other places. So it, like, in theory, like, it sounds great that you would have this this one kind of contract with the front end where you, you define all of these these nested objects and you just bring back what you need. Mm -hmm. But actually, like if, yeah, d depending on how you do it, like it could be really difficult to find those things from different places. It could be really slow and costly as well. Okay. So, so I want to dig into that a little bit because I'm always really interested in this because, you know, one of the things that I find fascinating about just development in general is that 
the more I learn, the more I realize that there's no such thing as a right answer. There's no, you know, there's no complete solution or silver bullet or anything like that. So when we're talking about a graph database, you're, um, is it, I guess, what is the, the main use case or, or when is it the right time to start reaching for a graph database? Where is it going to shine? Um, so the, I, I guess the, so the, from a abstract point of view, um, mm -hmm. you, you're kind of looking for, for the best tool for, for, for the best job. So, right. um, you would, you kind of use near for J where you'd have like a highly connected data set and like a, a social graph is a, um, is a good example of that because you're, you have people that are connected by certain degrees and certain weights to, to other things. Um, if you, if you think for, for example, like, um, um, like. Uh, routing of packages uh, uh, across Europe. If, if you sent a package across Europe, that's been uh, that the optimal path has been routed by a graph database. Um, okay. And basically, um, you would use a graph database in a in a time where you need to to query a highly connected data set um, in in real time, basically. Okay. Um, so um, yeah. So the, the the golden rule is if you've got three or more joins in your relational database, then you should be looking at a graph database. Um, oh, see, see, just just slow down from there. Yeah, I feel like I'm I'm starting to really appreciate heuristics like that, um, because as as I have been just expanding in my career and and building more and more things, what I've learned is I can build just about anything with just about anything, right? Like it's always theoretically possible to get something done using whatever tool is around, you know, you, you can, uh, skip all the tools and build the whole thing with just HTML and CSS and, and vanilla JavaScript. But the, the challenge then becomes, you know, you have like, you're, you're inventing a lot of frameworks along the way. And so as I've, I've been gaining expertise, I guess, one of the things that I've really learned to live by is, is heuristics like that. So that is a, a, a good one, you know, when is it the right time to think about a graph database? If you have three or more joins in your relational database. And, and so can you clarify when you say a join, can you give an example of, of a, a situation where you have three or more joins? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so I guess, um, the example could be that you have like a, uh, you, you, you run an online shop, you've got mm -hmm. a user's table, you've got a orders table, and then you have your products table. Um, so in that case, so you kind of have to do some, some, some sort of magic to, because you can't do like a many to many relationship between a, um, an order and a product, for example. So you end up loading like a, an order line table, which is a, um, uh, so it's kind of like an unnatural modeling and it takes a lot in kind of like the, the main layer of your application to get that thing to work. Um, and there's, yeah, lots of, lots of things you have to go around to, um, or lots of hoops you have to jump through to, to, to sort that out. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas in, in Nifij, you, you'd, um, you'd model that as a, a node for the order and then you'd have a, uh, like a direct relationship to, um, the product. And then you could have on the relationship, a, um, a set of properties to say, you know, what was the, the price when they bought it? Did they use any discount codes? Um, you know, the, the quantity, things like that. Um, and then, so if you take a, uh, a, a step, step back from that as well. So, um, when you look at, um, querying across tables in a relational database, or even in like a, in, in a NERSCR database, um, what happens is when you, um, when you query that data, the joins are calculated at read time. So you basically, so you, say you have like a foreign key between two tables, um, you would, um, you'd find the, the record that you want in the table. Mm -hmm. Um, in the same, for example, the, um, the, the order table, um, and then you would find the, the, the order and then you would join the order lines. So, I mean, the more successful your business is and the more things you right. sell on your, um, on your shop, the slower that's going to get, because the, the index for the, um, for the foreign key that you use on the join is going to grow over time. Right. So yeah, the, the, the more, the, like the, the, the more your shop sells, the more rows are going to be in that table, the longer that query takes. Um, so with near for j um, and graph databases in, in, in general, they, they use this, this concept called in, index for adjacency. So um, when you save data to um, a graph database, um, the, um, the, 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 the relationship between any two entities or any two nodes is stored at read time. So, um, uh, sorry, at, at write time. So every node is aware of every relationship coming into and going out of it. 
So you don't have to compute those joins at read time. You can just basically um, chase pointers in memory to find where that node is on on the other end of the uh, um, of, of the relationship. And that's what makes it makes it quick because the um, the the speed of the query is not um, proportional to the size of the database in total, but only the size of the, the, the data that you touch. If you have, um, say for example, um, five billion people in a, in, in, in a social graph mm -hmm. um, and you want to query my friends, I don't have to look through the whole um, database to find my friends. I can just go directly out through those relationships. So that is, that is really interesting um, because it's, it's sort of, it's putting what I'm trying to accomplish with something like a social media app as the the main focus of the the database that we're designing and I think that that's a really good it's a really good shout to like as a as a programmer my goal should be to choose the tool that solves the the use case in the most effective way and by looking at my data you know I'm I'm going to build an app that app is going to have a ton of relationships for discrete types of objects, you know, an e-commerce shop, a social media thing, a, you know, even like even looking at a just a, a blog, you've got authors, you've got posts, you've got comments, you've got, um, you know, maybe you've got editors, maybe you've got categories, tags, each of those things now starts to make um, different relationships, right? And so if you if you see lots and lots of relationships, then knowing that you're designing something to be multi-relational like that where you do have lots and lots of different ways the data connects to itself you can say oh well i know that if this like you know for basically for convenience up front because i want to be able to just say yeah give me a post and the author of that post and all the comments for that post and the categories and then related posts based on those categories in a graph database i just say that and it works in a, a relational database i am saying Give me all the posts. And now I have the ID of the author. Okay, now make another query. Get me the author of this post by ID. Get me the comments for this post by ID. And maybe those comments come with their own relations of who the author is or, or things like that. And you suddenly have this really complex way of, of sourcing and aggregating data. Um, but, you know, on the, the flip side of that coin, if I have non-relational data like i have something where it's it is very clearly going to be one entity with maybe one relationship then maybe it's not worth thinking about the the graph relationships and stuff i can be pragmatic about the way these things grow um and you know it's also uh yeah it just feels like the the sort of thing where it's not necessarily a choice about what the best tool is for the the raw merits of the tool but rather for for fitness of purpose and yeah. um, mm -hmm. and th that's actually one of the reasons that, you know, people talk about uh, outside of, of Neo4j, when you talk about graphs, you'll see people be kind of absolutist about, well, everything should be GraphQL or everything should be REST or however they want to phrase that. And, and I find myself kind of in this camp where I'm like, well, I, I use them both based on which one is, is easier for me to scale or easier to work with based on the kind of data that I have. Um, and so you're, you're putting into words some of the, the decisions that I've been making just kind of based on convenience and uh, kind of extrapolating that out because I'm not doing things for millions of users where my database indexes or indices would be like slow, you know, none of the apps I build are that big, but they could be like if one of them runs away, you know, I accidentally create the next Wordle, it would be great to not have to rewrite the whole database to, to be efficient to support, you know, that type of attention. Um, so as you kind of start looking at this, what what have you seen? You know, I, I feel like the, the default answer is always going to be a social media or uh, you gave another one, which is really good, which is e-commerce. What are some other common use cases where somebody's going to really see the benefits of, of a graph? Um, so so I, I guess there's this um, this misconception maybe um, in, in the, the tech community that the um, graphs are like a, a niche thing. Um, I mean, like you say, you, you always use your, the, the right tool for the job. Um, but I mean, did, like graphs can can handle the, the the same loads that a relational database or a NoSQL database would would um, would use. Um, so, I, jokingly, I, I, I said in the um, in the in, in our in our um, Twitter DMs a couple of days ago that graphs are everywhere. Um, like it's so it's, it it's kind of like the the unofficial motto of Neo4j is that you know graphs are everywhere and, and you start to see them. So um, I I first found Neo4j I think like 
about eight years ago, I guess. Mm. And um, since then, I've been seeing graphs everywhere and, and connections everywhere. So there's um, the, the common use cases I used to work on in, in the field were things like real time recommendations. Mm. Um, so, you know, um, in, in real time, you know, show me like, even like that, you know, people who bought a product, uh, what else did they buy? I mean, that's, oh, yeah, it's it, it's not that complicated a query to write, but it's a slow one when you've got a, a huge database and a lot of customers. Um, so that's that's a good one because you're kind of hopping over a, a small part of the um, the, the, the network any time. Um, so the, uh, other common uh, use cases I've, I worked on things like uh, like fraud detection. So uh, like typically fraud is is um, carried out by rings of people. So um, oh, you know, it's like a um, so they have like a I think it's called like the the cash for crash scandal in, in the UK a few years ago. Um, and it's basically you know, one person would crash their car and get the insurance money. And then they'd end up crashing their car into somebody into somebody else, and then there'd be like this this chain of events, um, and that's it's a, an easy way to to find kind of this chain of people um, in, in a graph database. You, it would be really hard to, to write like a stored procedure in in a relational database to right. find that out, um, or like you know a credit card fraud and things like that. People using the same details um, in um, for, for their application. So sharing phone numbers, sharing addresses, things like that are, are kind of red flags. Um, you know, I, like if, if you think of networks, for example, like that, that's like a, a common thing is, is the connection between switches or servers is, is, um, is the most important thing. So you'd use a, use a graph for that. Um, okay. but I mean, literally, you know, could, could be, could be sort of, um, applied anywhere really. So, um, um, so one of the, the big things that um, BFJ has been been used for, like one of the big sort of public stories, um, has been things like you know the, the Panama Papers um, and the um, Paradise Papers. Um, um, there's one on uh, on BuzzFeed about Trump. I can't remember the name of it, um, but it's basically looking at like the um, so taking the the leaks, um, turning that unstructured data into structured data, and then looking at the connections between people. And then you can kind of see like oh. the the connections between uh, a, a certain former U.S. president and a um, head of state, um, you know, on, um, on, on the other side of the globe and, and things like that. Interesting. Um, and kind of like the, the the flow of money and things like that and, and how things go through. Um, I mean, I've spent some time with, with with a company who were looking at like you know Bitcoin and blockchain, and then I mean blockchain is is a is is a graph by definition really because you've got the the different transactions that, sure. that are loaded sure. up, but um the interesting things I, I guess going back to fraud is like you know how is the, what's the flow of money between the, these people like you know, nfts like how how are those M nfts moving through a network of people um these are all things that can be solved really easy just with a with a graph database and a like one line of cipher that, that could be you know thousands of lines of java to um or, or, or c plus to to find the answer yeah no that's that's kind of fascinating and, and it reminds me of another kind of growing niche area of popularity for graphs, which is just personal note taking. Um, if you use a tool like Obsidian or there's Foam for VS Code, there's uh, Roam Research and these sort of uh, these these personal databases where as you write, you can kind of categorize a word, you double bracket it or something, and then that makes a, a node and things like that. And, and you end up over time kind of getting this map of the way your brain has been working where you can see, oh, I talked about this concept many times. And then you can go back and sort of clean those up and add aliases and, and so, sort of things to really get this, this clear idea of the way relationships are forming in your head between different types of data that is, I mean, I've never seen anything that, that serendipitously surfaces relationships like that. Um, prior to this, you, you know, you would have to do something like, go back and reread all of your notes, or you would have to do a, a very dedicated project to surface the, the common things. And, and to be completely honest, most of us aren't going to do that, right? We're not going to take the time to go back and dig through this stuff and figure out how it all works. Um, but with a graph database, using, using our notes as the input for a graph, we suddenly start to draw these connections. Like I just did this the other day where I was looking at my work in progress blog posts. I've got, you know, a couple dozen things that I've started writing, didn't get all the way through it. And then I, I went and looked back and it turns out a bunch of them were on the same theme. So I was able to pull that together into one post and then, you know, publish the kind of the redux of these three or four posts that were all on a theme. And yeah. that sort of thing is not 
I, I hadn't even entered my realm of, of consciousness until you just said this, that that is in fact a graph database that has had a, a measurable impact on the way that I'm able to think and the way that I'm able to parse information. Um, so that is really interesting to think about because I couldn't have done that with a relational database, right? I couldn't have done that with, a, um, I can't, you know, you can't structure your brain. And so what, what I'm hearing in, in just kind of taking what all of what you're saying in a, uh, maybe a, a extrapolative direction here, um, is that graph databases are really good for finding things that you weren't looking for in your data. Uh, yeah. like you said it, with fraud or like I said, with notes, it, do you feel like that is a, a fair characterization? Yeah, yeah, definitely. But so the, 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 I mean, I, I hate the word, but the, the key word there is kind of like insights, finding insights in your, mm. in your data. And I, I know that's, that's kind of a, a salesy thing and maybe it's a bit of a, a bit of a cliche, but, um, yeah, I mean, it makes sense to know, like, what, what can I see within three degrees of this, this particular piece of data that I have, like, you know, what, how, how is it connected to, to other things? And it's something that you can visualize really quickly and, and kind of it, understand it quickly yeah. as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I now my brain's spinning. I want to. I kind of want to see this in action. So I think this is a good point for us to switch over. Let's go take a look at at how we can actually use a graph database. So I'm going to switch us over into the pair programming mode. And I just realized I made a small. Oh wait, maybe this will just work. Let's find out. I uh, I'm using a new system. I switched over to a video platform called Ping. Oh, and it works. I did an okay job. <laughs> but I'm in the wrong mode. Hold on one second while I switch this and fix it. Programming, there you go. This, will, this is the right one, probably. There it is, okay, uh, yeah. All right, everyone. So first and foremost, like we do every episode, I wanna send a huge thanks to our live captioning. We've got Ashley here with us today from White Coat Captioning. That is all available on the homepage of the site, learnwithjason.dev. While you're there, make sure you check out our sponsors who make this all possible. We've got Netlify, NX, and Backlight all pitching in to make this show more accessible and to keep the lights on, keep us all running and operating here. Uh, we are talking today to Adam, which I had your, let me go to your, there we go. Uh, Adam on Twitter, you can go and follow here. And this is a <laughs> anti-Java balance. <laughs> It's not all about Java, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, because I know zero Java. This would be a very confusing episode for all of us if uh, if we were going to go straight into Java. Um, but yeah, go make sure you give, uh, give Adam a follow. And we are talking today about Neo4j. And you can find more information about that here. So that is about the extent of what I know about Neo4j. I, I did to save some time, sign up for a sandbox. Uh, and the way that I did this is I did this get started and it uh, I used the sandbox and signed up for one of those. I just used my Google email and had to log in and all that stuff. And now I have landed here. I'm, I'm through, I'm in the sandbox. What's the first thing we should do? Right, so um, the first thing we should do is create a, an, an example data set. So there, there are kind of two ways that you can get started for free on, on Neo4j. So the, the, if you know what you're doing and, and you kind of want to want to play around, then you can use Neo4j Aura, which is our like free cloud offering. Um, you okay. can have like 175,000 nodes, uh, sorry, 50,000 nodes, 175,000 relationships, free of charge forever. Um, but if you just kind of want to play around, then there's the Neo4j sandbox that you can use. So the, um, the Neo4j sandboxes are like tiny instances with, you know, barely any RAM, but they work with the data sets that are there. Ah, um, should so... I have signed up for the Aura if we're going to share this as an example? Um, no, it's, so what, what we do with, we can, everyone can replicate on by, like, by creating a new sandbox, so it should be fine. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, there, there's a few options there, some some kind of interesting ones there. So um, if you scroll down to uh, recommendations, it uh, should be a little bit further down, um, just up a bit. Oh, Splat. so it's in the middle. Oh, here, yeah. recommendations. Sorry, I was looking for a headline, not a... Oh, okay. Here we go. Okay, recommendations. Cool. Um, and then click create in the, the bottom, uh, bottom left. 
cool. And it's so yeah, so this fires up you know, one of the um, sample data sets. So these last for for three days, and you can extend them to ten days if, if you want to play around. Um, yeah, get rid of that. <laughs> okay. So if, if you click open, then it will open up the the data set in uh, in the FJ browser. So the FJ browser is kind of like a um, um, like a visual um, querying um, tool, basically. Okay. Um, so you can explore the, the the data from here, and you can you know write cipher queries, which we'll, which we'll do today. Okay. Um, and then you can um, yeah just, just sort of look through the graph. If you want to look in broader scale, there's a tool there called NFJ Bloom, um, which will allow you to to visualize you know huge data sets. Um, so it's if if you go back to the sandbox and then click oh, on the bloom. arrow next to yeah Bloom yeah. Got it. Okay. That's one yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, just share this with everybody in case you want to peek at that later. All right. Cool. Um, yeah. So when you uh, create one of these sandboxes, it comes up with one of these guides. But I'll give you the the abridged version of this, so you can go through and, and click through it in the uh, in your spare time. Um, but if if you click on the um, top left hand corner, there's a database icon. Uh, if you click on that, uh, so like I said earlier, uh, like a, a graph is a um, a combination of um, nodes um, or set of nodes um, connected together via relationships. Um, so you can see from there, you've got um, twenty six thousand nodes in there. Um, so um, under the um, node labels, um, every node can have zero, one or more labels on there. So it's a way of kind of um, categorizing or, or tagging the data. Um, so if you click on person. Person. Um, yeah, so that should bring up. Oh. Um, so that brings up the first 25 um, uh, person nodes. And so th this is the point that, the, that I call the graph epiphany. So this is where, you, where you're going to start to get excited. So um, you see from from that guy there that you're um, that you've got on. So that is a um, if you hover over it, this one, uh, or or click on it. Yep. Um, so if you click, then you can see at the bottom of that result window, there's um, actor and person. So those are the the two labels for um, for this node. And then if you go right to the very right, there's like a a, a carrot icon. Um, so these are the the properties that are stored against that node. Um, oh, cool. So th this is this is all, all the data. So um, what you can do in this data set is you can search for all people regardless of who they are, um, or you can search for actors, or you can search for directors. So immediately you can start to like slim down your your data set. Um, so if you um, do, you recognize any of those actors there? Let's see if I do. Is, is there um, anyone that's interesting? Miriam Cooper. So it's, it's, it's quite an old data set, so um, there, there may not be some. Yeah, data. I'm. I'm who's, not who, very good at. Who is at... your your favorite actor from the nineties? Favorite? Oh, favorite yeah, or, actor or, or, from or the nineties. Maybe, maybe like early two thousands. Um, <laughs> what do you think, it... chat? Nineties, <laughs> early two thousands. Who's who's? Uh, I'm I'm leaning Brendan Fraser right now. Nicholas Cage. Nicholas Cage is always a fan favorite. Okay, cool. So if if you click on that um, match n person um, bit. So that should move it into the top. So this is the query, langu uh, query okay. language, which is called Cypher. Um, so th there's lots of references to things that sound a lot like the Matrix. Um, the founder of NIFJ is a big fan of the Matrix, and it it shows. Um, but yeah, so so um, Cypher is is the language that you use to qu to query NIFJ. Oh, um, chat! Did you all just did you all just get it? Neo Cypher. <laughs> I yeah. a light bulb just went off. Yeah, so I, I I don't know if it if it was the acronym or it's a backronym, but Neo Four J, um, uh, Neo is Network Engine f and, and Objects. Okay. Which came first? I'll I'll let you decide, right? Um, <laughs> but yeah, so, so so this language, um, it so it, it's a like a proprietary language built for graph databases that allow you to um basically search through, um, well, so so match graph patterns in in the database and and then find um like return them back. Gotcha. Um, and so this is the, the main thing for me when I started using the FJ like eight years ago. Cipher was just launched, um, and this was the thing that got me really excited because it's really like compared to SQL, it's really fun to write this stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's it's kind of like an ASCII art style syntax. So see where you've got n person in brackets there. Mm -hmm. So what you're doing is you're drawing a circle for a node, um, and then you're saying that the so after the the colon is the label. So right. um, you're finding a node with a, a label of person. And then you're giving it a variable of n, um, mm -hmm. and then you're saying return n limit twenty five, and um, to to give you the the first twenty five. Um, so if you want to do relationships, you draw them in like a square box and put um, dashes either side, 
um, and then um, put the the type after a um, after a colon. In there. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's it's like a like a really nice way to um, to, to query. Um, so if you just before the bracket, if you put um, the the close bracket, sorry. Um, if you put a space and then op um, so open curly braces. Get some curly boys in there. Um, oh no, sorry, the like the the Jason ones. Um, I don't know what you call them. Oh, curly boys, got it. Yeah, that's one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then you do name colon. Um, and then in speech marks, put the name of the actor of your choice. And we decided on uh, Nicholas Cage, I think. Or actually, you know yeah. what? Let's just really stay Keanu Reeves. Keanu Reeves, yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, and then if you um, hit enter on that. Oh, hit enter. Yeah, or, or, yeah, or, or press play. So that gives you Keanu Reeves. So you can double click on that and then you can um, see the, the movies that, that Keanu Reeves has acted in. Whoa. Um, <laughs> so it's, I mean, it's, 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 it's quite, a, quite a small data set. But, um, so you can see that the um, you've now got a, a set of nodes that are connected by like arrows and um, um, yeah, arrows and, and, and a type. So if you click on that match n person again. Match um, n person. Yeah, and then after the, the, the close brackets, yeah, do a dash. So um, open square bracket and then colon. And then um, so um, do acted in so you can click on or yeah, select that one. Um, and then um, put another dash at the, after the, the square bracket. Oh, after the, okay. Yeah, outside, yeah. Um, and then a, so like a more than arrow, so say like this is a relationship in an outgoing direction from Keanu Reeves. Okay. Uh, draw another node. Um, and then give that an, an alias. So I guess this would be like M. Oh, um, M, M. colon movie. Yeah. Ah, I understand. So N is a variable name, not like yeah. a shorthand for node. Yeah, exactly. Got it. Okay, got it. Cool. Um, and then you can do, so colon movie, so you'd always... Um, would have acted in in, in a movie so uh, with a uh, uppercase m um movie L like this yep okay sounds good yeah um so that that is matching a pattern in the database of a person node with an outgoing relationship to um to a movie okay um so in order to return it um so you you first match oh a pattern and then i need to return to... after that so yep, do so... i need to change this to m uh, so if you do n colon m, n colon m. Uh, sorry, um, not colon, uh, comma, m m col. So you, you're you're kind of listing what you want to return from that that pattern above. Gotcha. I understand. So then that that gives you the that ah. data again. And so um, what we've so done now is instead of having to like click this to get the relationship, I'm able to kind of precede this visualizer with uh, by drawing this relationship. And this is really like when you said it's kind of like ASCII art, I I'm not going to lie. I immediately was like, uh oh, but this is actually really intuitive now that I know, you know, OK, so this is this is a node. And then we're saying along this edge or relationship is acted in to a movie. So this I, yeah, this makes sense. Like and and. Is it possible if I don't add one of these like i could just say give me all the movies related to keanu reeves by any relationship by just putting in an arrow yep okay yeah, so so, so there, that's a good sign that this arrow. is intuitive is that i just guessed that and it would have worked <laughs> yeah yeah so, so you could you could kind of say you know give me um everything that, that is within three degrees of keanu reeves which I, I guess could be could be quite an interesting thing so if you if you remove the colon acted in Um, and then do so if you do star one dot dot three, um, okay. and then remove the the arrow so the um, just before the the movie. So um, and then put, uh, leave the dash in. Sorry. Oh, leave the dash in. Okay. Yeah. So this is saying give me um, every uh, what well, so this would be every movie within one to three degrees of. Um, of Keanu Reeves. So if you hit enter on that or, or play and uh, run the query. So it should connect it all together. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. So, so this is giving you, so if you, um, sorry, if you click on the end person again, 
um, so the sorry the um, yeah the query. If you do before the n, if you do p equals brackets n. Uh, so uh, outside of the brackets, yeah, p equals, and then return p. So now instead of matching individual nodes inside um, the um, the database, you're actually matching a path of nodes. So you could say, like, okay. give me the shortest path between two actors. So this is everything from, from from Keanu Reeves and then going out to somebody else. So the limit's only 25, so it's not not a huge data set. Um, so actually, if you do um, just um, star three rather than one to three, then it will give you paths of, of three length rather than getting the first length and the second and the third. Okay, um, let me let me try to explain back what I'm seeing here to make sure that I am understanding what just happened. So mm -hmm. we said match the path of anything, any movie within three degrees of Keanu Reeves. Yep. And what the path did was it said, okay, Keanu Reeves is within three degrees of Thriller and everything that's being returned is connected to Thriller. So we can say that's the path to Keanu Reeves um, is like through Thriller. So th so Thriller is, is the genre. So what it's doing is it's going, for example, from Keanu Reeves into Johnny, is it Johnny Memento? Johnny then Mnemonic? In, yeah, sorry, yeah, no, sorry, the text is a bit small for me. Uh, that, so then it goes into to Thriller, and then it goes out to the other movies that are in Thriller. And so it basically uh, so found a common that node that it could connect everything through? Yep. Fascinating. Yeah. So so what you could do is you, you could say... Um, you could say from Keanu Reeves and then do it to, um, I think to, so if you do star five rather than one to three. Star five. Yep. And then um, instead of movie, if you do person. So this, this will find people that have acted in movies that have acted in movies of people that have acted with Keanu Reeves, if that makes sense. Got it. Got it. Um, and up to, so we're basically playing six degrees of Kevin Bacon, but with a graph database. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so it's not a good sign. That it's uh... so what happens is so the um, when you use Bloom, um, so Bloom is written in Canvas or, or, or with Canvas, sorry, so I should say. So um, you can do larger visualizations. I think what's happened here is because the visualization is so big, this is SVG. It's um, it, it struggles. So. Gotcha. It's cool that you can blow yeah. this up too. I'm gonna take advantage of this so that we can see the um oh retry yeah. your operation did it do we make it too big yeah yeah so so if, if you change it to to three i guess um okay, I'll be... down or if you do limit limit one that could be... do you want me to decrease the limit as well yeah 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 that should that should help out okay yeah so like i say like these are really small like instances so okay no changes, no records. Okay, so, oh no, sorry, it'd be, it'd be two, because a, a person would act in a movie and then into another one, so it's two degrees of separation there. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Oh yeah, okay, so Keanu Reeves acted in The Gift with Katie Holmes. Yeah. So so imagine that was star five, and then you had loads of nodes there, that would be what it would, what it would look like. <laughs> <laughs> How much time do you lose to doing exactly this when you have this open um in the early days a lot of time i would um, say this would be solidly 50 percent of what i would spend my time doing if i worked on neo4j yeah i mean it's, a, it's definitely a lot of double clicking um, <laughs> and expanding things out but i mean that's, that's kind of the, the way that you learn about a data set it's like how is this related to to that this is great yeah. okay so and, and i mean this is magical too because it, it really does show like, okay, how many people have acted with Keanu Reeves? And if I lift this limit to say 10, whoops. Then we'll start to see quite a bit of, uh, you know, like, oh, here's one one particular movie. Uh, and we can see all of this. This is just, I, yeah, I love this. And I can see if I'm building, you know, 
a recommendation database or something. If I notice that, uh, say, Marissa Tomei is in a lot of movies with Keanu Reeves and I've liked the ones that I've seen, then I could look at any of the others and, and recommend that or, you know, look for other commonalities here that are just going to start showing up by nature of surfacing this data. And we, you know, we already found kind of serendipitously, we didn't talk about genre, but it found thriller and said, oh, a lot of these movies are related to Keanu Reeves via being a thriller. Now that's sort of a, you know, random chance that that happened and not all of Keanu Reeves' movies are in thriller. But if I was into thrillers, I could say, show me all the movies that are, you know, related to Keanu Reeves that are thrillers and, and filter that way. So my, my brain's kind of spinning with ways that this would be really useful and useful in ways that would be really difficult if I had to manually write queries to make it happen. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, yeah. It, imagine if you were saying, find me any actor that's within um, two and 10 degrees of a particular actor at a certain time. Like if, if you're writing that in a, um, like a, like a SQL query, you do like, you know, left joins and it, it would just be a, coalesce statements and all this stuff like it, it would be an absolute mess to do that whereas you can write this stuff in um in like just a single line of uh, uh a cipher mm -hmm. um so the one of the, the data sets on the the sandbox is on um the uh oh, what's it called so it's like um sorry my mind's gone blank uh, but basically it's sort of like uh locations um ordinate survey um data so you could say like you know find me the the shortest path between two like oh, oh, how how would I get from a um I don't know a, a, a coffee shop to the Statue of Liberty or whatever you know sure and, and then you can just follow that that path through the database to um to to find that and that'd be really hard to to do in a um in a, in a relational database but like out of the box well that's it, the um, supported with cipher isn't that the the traveling salesman problem like isn't that the one that we've decided is intractable. <laughs> <laughs> like, does it, is that solved with, uh, with a graph database or is it, I suppose it's not like the most mathematically provable optimal point. It's just the, the best point based on the data we have. Um, but that's still, that's a very hard problem to solve. Yeah. So I, I remember a very cold night in Turin, um, where I was on, on location with a client and, and speaking to um a, a couple of people to say like how would you actually do this um this this traveling salesman problem in, in the for j and they were like well why would you bother but so so basically what you can do is is you can um be finding people that have acted in some of these yeah i was just um, curious if we if we want to play like six degrees of kevin bacon we can just yeah. you know filter on the the other or wait this would be yeah node person Keanu Reeves, and we we end up with all that, and we could probably set. Sorry, I cut you off while you were doing the. You were talking about that traveling salesman problem. Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah, so I was gonna say like, so this is where Java comes in. So the J is Java, and if J is written in Java, you don't need to use Java. But um, so for ninety nine percent of the use cases, it's good enough to write Cipher. If there's something that's too difficult to to represent in Cipher, or or something that um, is kind of like computational computationally heavy. Mm -hmm. then you could write a store procedure in Java to, to do the traversal. Um, I spent oh, okay. a lot of time sort of writing those as well, which is uh, an experience. Yeah. So what if, what if we do want to play Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon, where what we're trying to do is determine how, like, what is the path between actors acting in movies to get to Kevin Bacon? Um, so we, we want to take a starting actor... And then we can only traverse through movie nodes and actor nodes to get to uh, Kevin Bacon. Can right. I express so, that in Cipher? Yep. So, so there's a there's a shortest path function in like supported with Cipher that you can use for exactly this this kind of problem. Okay. Um. So you do p equals shortest path, and then in brackets you do the um the the, the pattern that you're you're looking for. Uh, is it camel case? Snake case. Yeah, capital P. Okay. Um, and then a, a bracket around that, and then a bracket at the end of the. Um, uh, square, square boy. Uh, circle, sorry. Circle. It's like a like a function call. Round boy. Yeah. And, and then, then one just before return. All right. 
Cool. And that, so where you've got star six, so that's the, so you're saying right now, find me anything through six um, relationship types. Mm -hmm. So what you can do is you can say um, colon, um, and then it would be, so acted in would be the, the relationship type you're looking at. Or you could say directed as well. Um, so if you do like a, a pipe and then directed. Okay. Yeah. And then if you do star like um, two dot dot, Given up upper limit of like five or something or, or six, I guess. Yeah, six um, degrees of Kevin Bacon. Yeah. So we'll, we'll be faithful oh, yeah, yeah. to the. <laughs> yeah. And then, do we yeah, need so... to make this a uh, an arrow? Uh, no. So, so you would go outwards from the Kevin Bacon node into a movie node, but then the relationship from the other side would be an incoming one to that that relationship. So, uh, sorry, into that node. So you would leave off the relationship at that point. If you Got just it. wanted to say, like, you know, go down a road in one direction, then you could ah. use that. Um, but, yeah, in, in this case, that, that we wouldn't. So, yeah, so, so what you're saying is find me the shortest path between a node with a name property of Kevin Bacon through acted in or directed relationships from two to six degrees to another node with a person label on there and then the, the name Keanu Reeves. Oh, does not support minimal length different from zero or one. Oh, I screwed something up. What? Oh, so if you um, take take off that uh, the colon before directed, so it's the it's the same like relationship type. I oh, I understand. Okay. Yeah. So now th this should work. Yeah. If I cross my fingers. Oops. Should... Uh, does not wait. What have I? Oh, sorry. No. So if if you take if you take off the two, so it's just dot dot six. Ah. So this will be anything up to up to six degrees. There so, it is. Yeah, Kevin okay. Bacon acted in Tremors with Fred Ward. Uh, give me, give me yeah, someone else. Chat. Let's try this. Who else do we want to see play? We're playing Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon with Neo Four J. <laughs> from from up until like the early two thousands, because it's quite <laughs> old. So. Uh, I I don't actually know. I, I should probably know, but I don't know um, what the what the longest path is. Nicholas Cage, The Crudes with Ryan Reynolds to R.I.P.D. with Kevin Bacon. <laughs> I love this game. Clint Eastwood, here we go, one more time. Clint Eastwood. They were just in Mystic River together. <laughs> I love this. This is so much fun. I, and, you know, like... These, so there's, there's part of this, which is like magic is draining out of the world because now you don't have to remember things. You can just Google all of it and it will be solved instantly. Uh, but on the other hand, how magical is it that this, this really challenging thing of, you know, digging through tons and tons of information, this happened in milliseconds and we were able to solve this problem. That is unbelievable. Um, so this is this is extremely cool. So uh, a question here is, can this interface display any graph data from any graph database, or only data in Neo4j? Uh, so this is this is just Neo4j. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then Jacob is asking, can we filter based on connecting nodes, like only sci-fi movies, see how people are connected together? Yeah, so so you just define in like when you write the pattern. So we've got like a simple pattern there, but you would you define like going through to a movie, which then had a property of sci-fi genre of sci-fi. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's that is very very cool. Um, this is you know this is really really interesting because it it yeah it just I, I'm very excited about the possibilities here. So. Based on that, how would I get a data set in here? I think you and I talked a little bit about, you know, what if we load in all of the Learn With Jason episodes? We've got, I think we're at 270 now, um, and there's a lot of information in here. So how how would you pull that in to to make it a Neo4j database? Um, so yeah, I mean that's 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 important. Your um your your episodes, and then then create a little bit of a graph out of that. I think that could be, could be quite yeah. Fun. So I have. Uh, API episodes here and this will get like the first 50 
And if we want to get all of them, I think it's page two. Yeah. So I've, I've got them paginated, but this will give us at least the first 50. Cool. What is the best way for me to send you through something that I've prepared earlier? Uh, throw it into probably our Twitter DMs would be the easiest. Okay. Cool. So yeah, I've, I've wrote all this um, this morning. Um, so the, the the most common way that people would import data into um, into Neo4j would be through like CSV files. So you'd export it from a relational database, or you'd have CSV files in, in a certain format. And um, yeah, off off you go. Um, so there, there's a load CSV command that you, oh, you can so um, you can do that with. Um, okay. But um, because this is JSON format, so like I said earlier, like if, if there's things that you um, that are hard to express in Cypher or, or not possible to do in Cypher, you can write some Java code in order to do that. So APOC is a set of procedures and functions um, that do a lot of the hard stuff for you. So there's like JDBC connections, so you can connect directly to, to a database. Um, so in, in this example, it's um, apoc.load.json to load in um, Okay. Um, a, a list of JSON. So if you just copy that first line and then run that in the um, in the sandbox. Here. So yeah. I'm going to go up here. Yeah, and then just hit enter. So what this will do is it will go away, get the JSON, and then um, list that on stream. So you get one, basically one row per item in that JSON array. So we've got all, all got the, the properties there um, that we can work with. So I, I, I was a little bit disappointed that the tags were null on everything because that could have been that would have saved me a job. But I've actually written the the thing to to create some tags anyway. So yeah, um, I, it... <laughs> dang it. Um, my older episodes have tags, but that uh, uh, okay. yeah, we fell off on that. Yeah, so sorry to to call you out, but um, so um, so yeah, so when you call a, a procedure, you you yield a value. So every um, item in, in the array in that JSON will be um, will be a value that gets added in. So then what you do is is you can use the either the merge or create keyword to to create data. So you could so create will create a node regardless. Um, what merge will do is it will look it's kind of like an upset. So it will look for the data. If that data doesn't exist then it will create it. Got it. Um, so what this is saying is um, create an, a, a node with a um, a label of episode with the um, ID of the underscore ID, so that's good. I guess like the the, the Mongo ID or Azora or Sanity, yeah. Um, yeah, okay. Um, and then, so if if that node doesn't exist, then set the set of nodes. So set the create at that time, and then set some some values. So so this um, on line eleven. So this is kind of inspired by GraphQL. So it kind of goes kind of goes both ways. So this is um, so for everything inside value, you can do like dot something to pull that out. Um, mm. Or you could say, like for example, the slug because it's a nested item, nested mm -hmm. slug, and it's value dot slug dot um, dot current. Great. Um, so the lines fourteen to sixteen are commented out because um, there's always only one host. So I thought let's uh, let's let's not worry about that. Um, and then so inside um, each of the the values, the the guest is an array. Mm -hmm. um, so what this is saying is for each of the values inside that array. Create a person node with the um, the name of the the guest dot name property, so it adds that value in. Um, set some additional properties, and then um, merge a relationship between the episode and the guest to say that the episode has guest. Great. Um, so if you want to copy and paste all of that in, and that should uh... the whole the whole thing here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I'm going back to here. And then I cross my fingers that it's all okay inside this, like with the with the rest of the the data there as well. Okay, should be fine. Added ninety two labels, created ninety two nodes. Cool. So if you click on episode on the um, yeah node labels, and then double click one of those. So this is so that is Taylor Barnett and Sermonus something. Great. Um, Cool. Um, yeah. So if you go back to the the gist again, back to the gist. So the the next one is um, oh no. So yeah. So the the bottom one uh, tags .cipher. So this is kind of a, a rudimental way to create some some tags. Um, so I'm f so for every um, episode node, uh, I'm taking the title property and splitting it by a space. So you get every individual word inside there. Yeah. Uh, doing a, a filter on there to say only use the words where 
Um, so I saw like, you know, like when you had with, um, it was in lowercase. So I thought well, if we pr like only use the stuff that's in uppercase, that might remove some like stop words. So like in, in theory, you, you want to remove stuff like I and the right and things like that. Um, so yeah, that, that's basically what, what that one does. Um, there's a, an APOC function called apoc.text.clean, which basically removes all of the, everything that isn't alphanumeric and then converts it to lowercase. So if you spout Jamstack in two different ways, then that would represent like one, one label. And then it creates a tag um, using that word mm -hmm. and then creates a relationship between the two. Um, so if you copy up until, yeah, so up until line 20 and then run that, um, you could probably run them both actually. Let's start here and then make sure that it's doing what we expect. There it goes. 149 labels, there they are. Cool. So dang cool. Um, all right, and then down here, we're deleting the the noisy ones. Like, yeah. I use the word build in just about every title, so it's not particularly helpful. Um, your learn, yeah, those will all be the same. So I can take this, and that'll just let us get rid of some of the messier ones, like this one here. Okay. So then I get back here and now we have, well, this is 25 tags, but uh, we have quite a few here. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's limiting to the first 25, just so no one blows up the, the database when they mm -hmm. click something. Uh, yeah. So if you double click on one of those, you should see some, uh, some relationships that let's try one that is episodes. going to be. Uh, functions. We got a lot of episodes about functions. Apparently we got two episodes about functions in the last 50. Perfect. Cool. Um, yeah, so that's, um, yeah, so the, the relationship's been, been um, created between those two. Uh, if you head back to the the, uh, the, uh, the gist again, um, there's the second one is basically some, um, some codes for, for exploring. Um, so in the first one, so like I said, like every node is aware of the incoming and outgoing relationships that are connected to it. Um, so they also, um, they also keep like a count of, of these relationship types as well. Um, so this will show you the most popular tags. So based on the size of the, um, or like the, the count of the number of, um, has tag relationships going into that, that T node. That makes gotcha. Sense. Now it, it doesn't seem happy about this. Is that, oh wait, let me hover. What does it say? This feature is deprecated and will be removed in future versions. Um, shouldn't be. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I, I, I'll put something in the, the in, in the show notes, I guess, if, uh, if and when that gets that gets taken away. Um, but yeah. So, so the, these are the the most um, the most popular tags. So you, yeah. you, you talk mostly. So recently, I guess in the last fifty, you, you talk most about Next.js. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Next.js, Jamstack, another... GraphQL, Serverless. These all. Yeah. These all track. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so so we can now sort of explore that from um like from from a particular tag like what um what episodes are, are tagged with a particular tag or we could see you know for um so i think the, the the bottom query is like the 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 most similar episodes to to a particular one that you wanted so if, if we take this one for example um we could find out based on those tags which would be the the most um um the most similar to it Okay. So I guess maybe this one's probably not the, the best example. But if if you run it, then then you should see um, um should see some results. So um, before, where you were returning like n and m in the in the in the queries, you're returning um, like graph objects, nodes, and relationships. Uh -huh. So NFJ browser will display those as a graph, or you can switch into to table view. So now, because we're returning only properties and not actual graph things, right. we only get a, a, a um, table response back. Gotcha. And so in, in this particular instance, what we have done is we're saying, I want episodes that have a tag, and then we go the other way. So, so we're going, both relationships go into the tag, and then these episodes have two tags in common and therefore would be the most related. Yeah. Okay. 
this makes me want to load up my if if I reuse these uh well I guess we'd have to do a whole bunch of work to get the the tags parsed out in the the older stuff but yeah there, so that there is a quick way to to do it but it may explode the database so I'm, I'm reluctant not to but, but you could basically do like a um, an unwind statement which turns like a a list of things into one per row and then you could say oh, like, okay um, unwind range of two to 50 yeah and then load that page and then load it in and, and sort of go from there but yeah because these are very small databases like it um yeah it, it could because could cause issues sure but this is i mean already I, I can see how useful this would be because this rather than being say show me all of the episodes tagged with Jamstack, I'm instead saying, show me the episodes that have the most tags in common with the current episode, and I can just kind of filter that. Uh, and then I can prioritize, of course, and say, like, you know, out of the ones that I get back, you know, grab the ones that have serverless or, or whatever first. But this does a huge amount of filtering and what would have been manual work for me to pull all of the tags and then do some parsing to figure out which episodes were in both lists and then, you know, uh, combining all of that, the graph just does that for us. Mm -hmm. And yep. that is really handy, like really, really useful. I'm already, I have already got it in my head now. I'm like, how could, you know, how could I use this in a way that would uh, in improve episode recommendation? Because right now on the website, there is no episode recommendation because I don't have an easy way to do it. <laughs> and this actually kind of solves that problem if we get back into tagging episodes, um, which is, you know, something that's been on my list. I just haven't gotten around to. If we get all the episodes tagged, then we have quite a bit of, of immediate improvement to the quality of, of the website because we can recommend episodes that will kind of lead somebody through a, a learning journey, a related learning journey, instead of just saying, well, yeah, you're, you're here about this episode and we think you might be into these ones or you know me showing my personal favorites which you know that's what the home page is for right mm -hmm. yeah and so if, if we take it to like the next step back as well what you mm -hmm. can do is create a hierarchy of tags so i mean like jamstack next.js could all be under javascript so uh, the, there's a problem with recommendations called like the, the cold start problem so how do you um provide recommendations where um but like none like where, where no data exists basically um gotcha so you, you can use um like content-based recommendations and um then you can use um um collaborative filtering which is like you know people who bought this have also bought that that sort of thing um so what you could say is instead of just going to that um to the first tag you could go to the tag and then optionally go to the parent and then see anything that's tagged in the parent or uh -huh. things that that a tag was something that belongs to that parent and you can sort of traverse through the hierarchy up and down and um yeah and, and find the, the 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 data that you're looking for that is yeah so and i can see how you know that one of the challenges that i have run into with data in general is that i will get too gung-ho about trying to categorize and tag and and really get structured about my data uh thinking that i'm going to do things like this and then the the level of difficulty to both keep up with it, you know, I, as we've seen here, I can't even be bothered to just do straight tagging, let alone uh, going in and doing like really hierarchical stuff. But when it's easy to use the results of that effort, the incentives change a little bit. You know, right now when I tag, it's kind of like in the future, someday I'll actually use this and therefore it falls off the priority list because I'm not using it right now. If I actually have a way to display recommendations based off of tagging that makes the content more useful, well, that changes the priority list a little bit. Now I actually have a reason to go and do this. And so that also is, you know, the, it's a good, I think, example of the, the business value of looking at the right technology for the job. If I have a graph database, suddenly certain things that are extremely valuable, like recommendation engines, aren't quite the technical hurdle that they would have been with the technical, you know, I'm right now I'm using a, a fairly relational database and it's, it's good. Like there's nothing wrong with the, the database that I'm using, but it doesn't have it, like, it's not doing this. It's not it immediately showing me, oh yeah, these are your episodes that are most similar based on tags. Um, 
that's the sort of thing that I think is is you know pretty pretty dope as a as a user of a technology to be able to say oh this just cut a couple days of of debugging and and manual JavaScript or whatever coding language of pulling data and munging it and getting it combined and doing sorting and testing and making sure I didn't accidentally create a bunch of crap because I over queried or something you know like there's all these questions that I I have sort of avoided with these four lines of cipher code. Yeah, definitely. And in, and this is just uh, sort of scratching the surface. So you, um, is like Cypher is kind of like a procedural language as well. You can do lots of things with it. So you could you could do reads and writes inside the same query. You can do like a use the the with clause to to do sort of pre-processing. And so what you could do is you could say instead of return. Um, the, the value you could say with e1 e2 and then the collection of them then you could create the direct relationship between them and you can do all that inside one query so you can do quite a lot inside okay. one query that you maybe wouldn't do like it, it would take you uh, i don't know like three javascript files to to write which is quite cool um so yeah it's, it's just kind of getting your head around what the, the what the po possibilities are and then not being um not being too sort of startled and uh, um sort of shocked by them to, to actually do them yeah yeah this is um a lot of possibilities here i feel like chat how excited are you to dig into graph databases right now like what what ideas are you having looking at this that you want to go dig into now that you've kind of seen what is possible here um as, as an example something that i'm thinking about right now is is there a way that i could do a round of tagging, but then also allow people to add their own tags to episodes, which would then let people kind of improve the recommendation engine by tagging episodes. Um, and you know, it would, we'd probably have to come up with some way to show you what's already been tagged. So you don't get duplicates and things like that. And there would obviously be a, a manual review process before any of that got accepted, but it could be an interesting way to improve the the quality of the show. Um, ah, Shay Sheik is saying autonomous vehicle path planning. That's that is, yeah, a great use of of that uh, that kind of graph database thing. Um, it may already be being done. Yeah, yeah. I, I cannot confirm nor deny, but um... <laughs> decentralized yeah, real time apps and chats. I could, yeah, I can see that being a thing. Um, yeah. Have you, do you, is there a lot of like real time support here? What is, what does that look like? Uh, can you do subscriptions or uh, WebSocket or, or anything like that? Uh, not at the moment. So a couple of years ago, I wrote a blog post on how to, how to do it. Cause I wanted to do it on one of my own um, websites, but um, so basically there's a, so there's like a Kafka connector that you can plug in. So you can okay. basically with like a few lines of config in the, the newfj.conf file. Um, you can set up like a um, a publish um, sort of loop to publish to Kafka, and then what I did is consume that in a, um, a Node.js application, and then send that out through web WebSockets to the front end. Um, so that's kind of the, the best way to do it at the moment. The NFJ GraphQL library doesn't support them at the moment, but I'm told that it's on the roadmap. But I don't quite know where where on the roadmap that would be. But um, yeah, it's, uh, I guess like yeah, sort of Kafka or something like that would be the the best best option or I guess like anything like that that supports Java you can write a Java extension that that pings out a message to something when something happens mm -hmm. yeah so maybe a, a question to ask here as we're we're coming to the end and and we're really hyped on this when are what are the situations where you wouldn't reach for a graph database you know where, where do you see the the limitations or the trade-offs um so the one criticism that and I probably shouldn't shouldn't admit this, but one of, one of the, 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 the criticisms of um, Neo4j is kind of the the right performance. So if you want something where, and, and like, I'm talking like real sort of high end, um, mm -hmm. if, if you want real high throughput um, and you want to add billions of, of, of records per second into a database, then Neo4j isn't necessarily the thing for you. Okay. Um, but Equally, what you could do is take an aggregate view of that, put that into Neo4j, and then use it for kind of the graphy problems. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you could have like a um, maybe you'd have like a, a social network where your your data was stored in a um, 
um, so your your favorite document store, um, and then you take the aggregation to one side, or you take the um, the the friends and followers type things to, to one side, and, and that would live in in the graph database. Um, so you, yeah, it, you could quite easily build a connector that ports in data, even just like Netlify cron jobs, right? You can just mm. um, just just run one of those to um, to to take an aggregated view of the data for the last ten minutes, put yeah. it in the graph database, and, and then go from there. Um, so yeah, I, I think yeah, the the the, the right throughput is, is probably if, if you want something huge, then um, that's probably probably not for you. But um, NFJ can be used as a um, as, as a um, general database. Like it's not like the, the I guess the myth is that it's a it's a niche thing, but you can use it today on like on on, on your next project. Yeah. So that's uh, so maybe the the other question here would be um, we we looked into how to get data in. To Neo4j, and we looked into kind of how to query that data. When I want to get data out of Neo4j, how how does one do that? And is it the sort of thing where we can build a really rough proof of concept in ten minutes, or should we share resources instead? Um, I I'm up for the challenge of doing it in ten minutes. I'm so ready. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to make a new directory called uh, Neo4j. Uh, I'm just gonna there. Then, oops, Neo or J? No, what are we doing? There. All right. Um, so let me just get in it to to give us this project. So we have a an empty folder. What should I do? Like, is there a certain starter I should use, or can we query direct? What What do you prefer? Um, I th let's 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 go direct. So if you do um, just npm init. Um, yeah, that's it. Um, and so you would need the um, NFJ JavaScript driver. So npm install um, NFJ dash driver. So no. NFJ has okay. um, driver. drivers for Java, JavaScript, uh, .NET, C Sharp, and Go. And there okay. are some community drivers as well. Um, cool. So that's installed. So if you create a new um, like index.js or main.js or something. Are we running this as Node? Okay, so what I'm going to do is is build this as a uh, Netlify function. And then we're going to touch Netlify functions and we'll call this um, data dot there. And then I'm going to open this up so that we can code in here. All right, so I have uh, data dot TS and we've got the, the Neo4j driver available. So, okay. I'm just going to set up the, the base here. So we're going to return a status code of 200, and we're going to return body for now of uh, just OK. And now we're ready to pull in the Neo4j cool. driver. So if you uh, import Neo4j from Neo4j driver. Neo4j from Neo4j driver. Yeah, um, so that gives you a um, a function called driver, which allows you to to create a new instance of the driver. So if you say like you know const driver equals new, um, no sorry is uh, so not new, just neofj dot driver. Oh, neo four j dot driver. Cool. Yeah. So this takes two um, two arguments. So the first one is the um, the URI of the the instance, and the second one is an auth token. Uh, okay. So if you go into um, your sandbox, I think it's the so it's sandbox .nfj com. Here, give you the, yeah. So if you go into connection details, so if you copy that bolt URL, and then that's your your first argument. Uh, then you need an auth token, so it'd be nfj dot auth dot basic. Neo four j dot auth dot basic. Yeah, and then so the username is going to be near for j for this instance, and then the password you should be able to copy from there, um, from the UI. Okay. Cool, perfect. So that's the the instance of the the driver. So through the the driver you create a session, and then the session basically manages what um like the the connection to to the database. So I guess it, inside the handler you would do that. So sessions are kind of like lightweight things you can um 
pull them up and, and, and tear them down as, as you need to. Um, yeah. Like that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and then so with uh, with brackets as well to serve the function. All right, so then I'm going to be able to do stuff, and I want to begin a transaction. Um, so, so there there are well, so there, there are four ways of doing this. So the quickest way would be to do session dot run. Session dot run. Um, that's okay. not yeah. Um, let's let's go with that for now. So in production you wouldn't do this, but because we've only got like four minutes, that'd be fine. And is this um, uh, does it return a promise? Like, do we need to await it? Yep. Okay. Um, I can and smell, then, so, geez. That, so that's a, a function. So the first one is is the cipher query. Okay. Um, so if you do just like match n return count n or something like that. Match. Match. And then n in brackets. Return. Yeah. Count n. Count n like that. Yeah. And then if you do like as count. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Cool. Um, so the, the second argument, you can add like um, parameters into there as well as, as, a, as a map. You don't need to, to worry too much about that. Um, so that response um, gives us some, some information, but the main thing on there is a records array. Response.records. OK. Yeah. Uh, and then if you do, so I guess this is only one. Um, also, if you do um, return labels bracket n colon, um, oh, sorry, comma. Um, yeah, so labels, so like a, a labels, yeah, and like, then open bracket n, and then close bracket, and then a comma. Yeah. So what oh, we're like saying this? is for yeah, so for each one of the for each one of the labels, give me a count. So for each combination of, of labels. Ah, so gotcha. now we can do so. Um, records gives you a so records is an array, so you can uh, call um, map on that. Okay. Do I do I want to do that, or can we just dump the data and see? Um, yeah, yeah, you can yeah, you can do that. Yeah. So. Um... All right. So let's just start by running this. So I'm going to run Netlify Dev to get that function running, and then I'm going to go out here and do Netlify functions. And what did we call this? We called it data, and we get back data. Beautiful. Cool. So, so, so this is like the the raw record, um, but you can do so on. If you do dot map, that gives you a an individual record, and with that you can call dot get to get the, the the individual item. Okay, so we're gonna do response dot records dot map, yep. and then that'll give us a record, mm -hmm. and we wanted to return what now? Um, so if you if you say ret um, so if you return a new object. A new object. Um, I, 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 oh, no, sorry. So what you could do is just do record dot two object, and then that'll give you the object. Like that. Yeah. Okay. And then I'm going to return put into your, into your body. records, and we can come back out here and test it. Yeah. Hey. So that gives you the the labels and the count. Great. I love this. So there, there's one gotcha in there. So with the count, you see there's like a high and a low. Yes. Um, on there. So. Again, Neo4j is written in Java, so um, there's there's a di discrepancy between the integers that are stored in um, in Neo4j and used in in JavaScript. So JavaScript to 32-bit uh, right. integers, and um, they're 64-bit on um, in in Java. So for each integer, you have to call two number on it. Uh, in order to convert it back into the number, otherwise they've kind of lost it. So if it goes over, I came up with a, this number dot max underscore something limit. Um, if if it goes above that, then it converts it to a string instead. So it just means you don't you don't lose it. Got it. So if I do like record object equals, and then I can return instead uh, labels would be record object. Um, so you could just do record.get rather than create the, the record object. Oh. Oh, oh, oh. So I can do like record.get. Yeah. And then so it will be, yeah, that'll be, yeah, yeah. And I'm I'm making that inference off of this, right? Mm -hmm. yep. yep. And then here I can get the 
count and that's going to be record dot get dot count and then you said two two number two number yeah okay look at it go all right so i mean this is like this is perfect this is exactly what we were after and we didn't have to write a whole lot of code uh and at this point you know we we would m do most of the work in cypher and then we just pull out the pieces that we're we're trying to get do a, a tiny bit of massaging to get java and javascript to talk to each other and we're off to the races here and like if we wanted this to improve i could just change this to be as labels right and then i can change this to labels and out here Nothing changes visually, but our code looks a little bit less like magical, right? We've we've set the names of things, mm -hmm. and so they work the way we expect. Yep. Chat, is this dope or is this dope? Can I get a W in the chat? Um, yeah. So okay, this is this is very cool. I don't think we're gonna have time to dig too much deeper than what we've done now. I will publish this example. Um, is this gonna self destruct? Um, so that will disappear at some point. If if you don't okay. kill it yourself, then it then it will it will terminate. So if you convert those to um, uh, environment variables, then that should be uh, should be good enough. And then the, the user can just set their own environment variables and, and go from there. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm not going to publish this as a a running site. But what I'll do is um, we'll call this Neo Four J Bolt URL. And then we'll also get a bolt password. Or I guess this would just oh, be so Neo4j. So it's, um, so it's neo4j.auth.basic and then username and password. In the the username doesn't change. Oh, right? sorry. Yeah, sorry. I was looking at the wrong line. Yeah. yeah um, OK, so yeah. So we'll have the this basic setup here. Um, do I need to install node definitions? Probably, but I'll, so I'll put this up as a code sample for anybody who wants to see how to pull Neo4j into JavaScript. Uh, this, in this particular instance, we're doing it via, via serverless functions on Netlify. Um, and this requires a, a node environment, I'm assuming, like I wouldn't run this client side because there's passwords. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, so you can, um, but it's probably yeah recommended not to. So the, you can build like things called graph apps for, for Neo4j desktop. And they mm. just use the the uh, driver to connect over um, over the browser. So, so like near for j browser is a React application that uses the, the the driver, but you have to add in your own um, your own credentials there. Um, so yeah, storing those credentials probably isn't the, isn't the best idea. Have I seen people do it? Yeah, of course. <laughs> and and honestly, if you want to use it on the client side, just throw it into a serverless function like we did, because this keeps those those credentials secure, um, and we get this data which we can then call this from our, our client side code and no one can get at the username or password or underlying instance. They can only get what we query here. But as far as we're concerned, the, the level of effort is is roughly equivalent, right? We we write the code that we want and then I just call this data function instead of calling Neo4j directly from my client code. And we get all the security as well as the convenience of not having to like stand up a whole node server or anything to run it. Um, with that, I think this is probably as good a time as any to uh, to start asking you, what are some good resources for somebody who is looking to take this further? Where should you go next if you're excited about Neo4j and want to learn more? Um, so if you want to have a play around, I would go to um, Neo4j Sandbox. Um, if you've seen what you like, but you want to import some data in, then I go to Aura and I'd set up an account there and uh, create a free instance and, and, and start to play from there. Um, if you want to learn more, there's the de developer pages at nifj.com slash developer, um, which gives you developer guides on sort of how to get started. But what I would rec recommend is um, a course that I've just uh, written um, for um, app development with, with Node.js is on graphacademy.nifj.com. So my, my day job is working on uh, Graph Academy. Um, so there's a, a course there for, for Python if you're not a big fan of, um, of, of, of Node.js. Um, but yeah, so if, if you scroll down a little bit and then go to um, so curated learning paths, so those are the, the two. And so the, the, the Node.js course is, is a good one to start. Uh, so basically what you do is is um, I've pre-built like a repository with um, hard-coded values in there. 
for a fictional client called Neoflix. Um, and then you basically go through and you learn. So if you click on table of contents. Table of contents. Um, yeah, so, so you learn. So it, it, it will create an FJ sandbox for you and then basically challenges you on sort of data that's held in sandbox, but it teaches about the driver, how sessions work, um, why you shouldn't use session.run. Um, mm. You should use read and write transactions, uh, the type systems and the, the, the differences there as well. Um, and yeah, at the end of it, you get like a, a nice little badge that goes on your public profile that you can share with your friends, colleagues, potential employers, me, um, share it on Twitter. Yeah, so do what you need to. All right. So everybody, you got your homework. You're going to go follow Adam for all the all that Twitter goodness, learning more about Neo4j in not just Java, uh, Python, Node, Java. Uh, did I see .NET in there? Yeah, so those are coming soon. So um, we're, nice. we're a small team on Graph Academy. So sure, it's, uh, sure. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's but lots of process. lots of potential, lots of cool things to do. I'm really excited about the, you know, just what's possible with graph databases. You know, again, just going back and looking at this, what we were able to accomplish in very little time. We got, you know, data loaded in. We were able to play Seven Degrees of Kevin Bacon, which is is really a fun game to play. Uh, just lots of lots of cool things happening here. Um, with that, let's go and give another shout out to our live captioner. We've had Ashley here today from White Coat Captioning. Thank you so much, Ashley, for being here and taking all these notes for us. And that's made possible through the support of our sponsors, Netlify, NX, and Backlight are all kicking in to keep the lights on at the show. They cover the cost of, of live captioning. It's also covered by your subscriptions. I saw a couple of you subscribe today. Thank you so much. It really does mean a lot. Uh, please boop the heck out of us to celebrate your subscription. Um, while you're checking out things on the homepage, make sure you head over and look at the schedule. We've got so much good stuff coming up. Uh, we are going to be, uh, I'm out next week, actually. Uh, I'm gonna be taking some much needed time off. If you haven't booked your PTO yet, Go book some PTO. Please take care of yourselves. Let's try not to burn out here. When I get back, we're going to do something really fun. We've got our new product announcement. Uh, and Sean Grove, who is the, the lead engineer at Netlify, is going to be showing us how it all works. We're going to get into 11D serverless, which is really exciting. Uh, we're going to get into dynamic images on Node Canvas. There's so, it, you know, David Korshid's coming back to teach us more about state machines. B. Dougie, one of my favorite people, is coming back to get us into open source contribution and much, much more. So uh, please. Get out there, check that schedule, add us on Google Calendar. With that, Adam, any parting words for the chat? Um, thanks for, yeah, th thanks for following along and thanks for sticking along to the end as well. One thing I should shout out is that um, NIFJ have got their own Twitch channel as well. So um, some ah. of my, my colleagues in, in the DevRel team um, run um, weekly sessions. Um, so Alex, who's been answering some of the, the questions in, in the chat that I've seen, um, host that with, uh, with Michael. Um, and yeah, so we, we have sort of um, all sorts of, of uh, different topics um, and different things. And if if anyone wants to see anything else, then then feel free to, to get in touch um, and we can see what we can uh, put together. Excellent. All right, y'all. Well, with that, we're going to call this episode a soaring success. Thank you all for hanging out with us today. Thank you, Adam, for teaching us about Neo4j. We are going to go raid Alex Trost. So everybody stay tuned and join along in this uh, in this raid. Adam, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. We will see you all next time.